Welcome to Routing for Success, the show where we interview today's top logistics professionals, giving them a platform to share their stories and best practices. Today, we are talking again with Dean McCuba. Dean is the founder and managing partner of Crossroads Parcel Consulting. Prior to becoming a consultant, Dean served UPS and FedEx over a 37-year career across multiple professional positions in sales, marketing, and operations. We first spoke with Dean in episode number nine of the Routing for Success podcast, which quickly became the number one most downloaded episode of our show to date. I wanted to bring Dean back onto the show to discuss the potential of a UPS Teamster strike. The last time UPS actually went on strike was in 1997, and those that were around the industry at that time often use words like pandemonium to describe what it was like. In this episode, Dean gives us a brief history of the Teamster negotiations, including the strike of 97. He tells us what he thinks the chances are of there actually being a strike and what the potential impacts might be to the rest of the industry, including FedEx Ground. We also get into a discussion regarding a budding new concept, which is forward stocking distribution and how it's changing the industry. I am pleased to bring you Dean McCuba. Okay, we are back with Dean McCuba, Crossroads Parcel Consulting. Dean, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. So we're here to talk about the looming possible UPS strike. Uh, Before we talk about that, give us a little history lesson, Dean. Has UPS gone on strike before, and what were the situations surrounding that, and uh, and how did it play out? You know, in in the in the last oh approximately forty years that where I've been directly or indirectly involved with working for UPS or competing against them, you know the the negotiation process or the the collective bargaining agreement has come up for negotiation probably five or six times while I've worked there. They've only gone on strike once. That was in 97. And I believe that strike lasted about two weeks. At that time, I was at FedEx and I was in an operation support position and it was just hell. I mean, when UPS goes on strike, it is the end of the world. Now, there are many, many more drivers, not quite double, but almost double the number of UPS Teamsters members than there were back in 97. What that tells you is the impact is potentially greater because there's so many more. Their volume is almost double. Uh, so now, granted, there's more competitors out there, but but still, it, it would be devastating if they actually went on strike and nobody in their right mind, who's in the industry, wants to see them go on strike because they see it as uh, a money grab because they'll have tons of business. It's it's really, really awful. You have to, you, it, FedEx had to call in security because people would come to the FedEx stations and try and drop off hundreds or thousands of packages. You'd go to a, a FedEx Express drop box and there would be the whole box would be covered on the outside with packages that people just left there because the box was filled and they'd leave them around the drop box. So there were all sorts of issues when it happens. It's it's a very bad thing. I don't I don't think it's going to happen, but we've got to be cognizant of uh, of what's going on. So it's happened once recent in recent years. That was in '97. It was very very difficult. It did take um, UPS quite a while to recover from that. And then the only other thing I'd add is <clears throat> we're seeing some reporting right now that there is business moving over to other carrier solutions right now as 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 they try and secure uh, space. Well, it's really too late to make that happen. So if 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 you're a merchant or a shipper and you're on and you're and you're watching this podcast and you say, Whoa, I hope it's not too late. I want to go out there and and, and find a solution. You know, chances are <clears throat> you might find someone that says, well, we'll do the best we can, but that means they're, they're not going to be able to help you. If you haven't cut a deal with FedEx already to protect the business, if you gave it to them, then there's, there's very little you can do right now to get secure space with uh, an, another carrier. So that's where, that's where we stand. And, um, <clears throat> and we can talk about this in more detail. I don't think they're going to go on strike for a number of reasons. And and, and that's a little bit easy. And, and maybe we can go into that. Yeah, you know, Dean, I was talking to a contractor who's been in the business for a long time, back to the RPS days. And this contractor told me 
The last time UPS went on strike, it was pandemonium. That was the word he used, was pandemonium. So, yeah, yeah, let's go into detail a little bit more. So let's talk about the situation today. Uh, you know, why Why is there even a possibility of a strike? Well, the collective bargaining agreement is up for renewal, and it's up for renewal like every five years approximately. So we go through this approximately every five years, and, uh, you know, the, the Teamsters play hardball, and they threaten that they're going to go on strike if we can't do this, 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 and this. And it's just typical uh, union negotiations. What's interesting is we don't see this in America today because the unions are so weaker. Now, interestingly, we just did see this with the railroad industry in the past year with, with one railroad. And, then, and, that, and that got resolved, though that came very close to, to being a, a, a strike. Uh, but, you're, you know, it's just not really common, not only in transportation, but everywhere else. I remember growing up as a, 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 a young man and my dad worked at GM and you would hear that GM was always threatening to strike when their contracts came up. Also, other big companies were always threatening to strike. The utilities, the phone companies would go on strike. You just don't see this a lot anymore because Unions play a lesser role in commerce today. They represent fewer people from a percentage of overall workers as they, as they, as they have historically. So it's it's not as prevalent. So when it when it's potentially going to happen, uh, it's it, it's fairly unique and it's interesting and it gets a lot of attention. And then something else that's happening is is social media is just blowing this out of proportion. I mean, you just have all these pundits out there like me who, you know, who want to go ahead and and they're looking for something to print, right? And to put out there and, and get attention so they can grow their number of, of, of views and comments or likes or whatever it is. And and that's a little bit of a problem because while it, it, it might be over, it is over exaggerating, in my opinion, the actual condition because people are just looking for something to write and report on. And so that's adding to the mix right now. And this, and we've never had it at this level where social media was so prevalent. And I've never seen so many posts or, or electronic articles or whatever you want to call them uh, on the internet of, about a, a union related uh, issue as I have with this. Now, Dean, you had mentioned that you actually don't think it's likely that the strike will happen. And I want to revisit that uh, but before we do, so uh, just staying on the topic of why is a strike potentially looming? Obviously, they're coming to the end of their collective bargaining agreement. And so there's some negotiation that needs to happen. But why hasn't that negotiation gone smoothly? Why is it being escalated to the point where it's something that's public and visible? And whatever the chances are that it could result in a strike, how did it get to that point? I, I don't see that it's very much different than it has been in the last four or five iterations of, of this whole process every five years. This is just normal posturing on both sides. Uh, what makes it a little bit different this time is UPS has been knocking it out of the park from a profit margin standpoint in the past few years. A lot of that had to do with COVID, but they're also a very well-run company and they know how to make money. And their profits are record right now. Now, the quarter they're in right now, they're finally tanking. And it was it was time. I mean, the economy is slow and, and we should have seen it. The fact that they've been able to not feel that impact until now, FedEx has been tanking for, for like six quarters, okay? So the fact that it hasn't happened to them till now is, uh, is a testament to the way they manage their uh, their business and and they and they they do a great job. So I don't think it's a bigger deal right now. I, I it's just getting like I said, social media. It's getting more attention just because people are are looking for something to to talk about. Also, e-commerce is so big now compared to where it was, and and that residential delivery is really really hard to to support in normal times. And so it's getting more attention because it's touching the consumer directly because the consumer for the first time, 
may not be able to get a delivery five times a week from uh, from FedEx or UPS if they're not using Amazon. And, and so that's the other thing. Consumers are going to feel it. And God forbid they have to drive to the mall, if there are any malls left, and go to a store and, and buy something. So that's another reason why uh, the consumer's going to really feel it if it happens. And, and that's raising a lot of concern. And obviously, everyone in the industry is also a consumer. And, and so they're, you know, they're talking about it, too, because they know what the impact's going to be. So, so that's, those are a couple of reasons. Or I don't think it's a huge deal, but I understand why it's being represented as a huge deal. Yeah, you know, Dean, you talked about in 1997, the last time that UPS actually did go on strike and it was pandemonium and people were leaving packages everywhere. FedEx today has been trying to capitalize on this climate of fear around the possibility of a UPS strike. At the FedEx contractor gold event that was held in Pennsylvania uh, just a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago at this point, FedEx was really touting their own horn that they've been leveraging that possibility with some large accounts. And they didn't disclose exactly in that meeting. I don't know if it's come out since then, but they they claimed that they actually were able to get at least one big national account and woo them away from UPS and into the FedEx network, uh, basically leveraging the fact that, hey, if UPS does go on strike and you call us, we're going to tell you no. So if you want to work with us and mitigate that risk, you need to do it right now. Sounds like they may have been successful in that, really pushing that story. Okay. I don't know who the account was. Um, <coughs> excuse me a second. <coughs> I think if they're talking about their wins regarding that initiative, by March by March 31st, you had to sign a deal to give all your business to, to FedEx. From what I'm seeing is I don't think it was hugely successful. I only had one client come to me and say, what should I do? Should I, you know, should I negotiate a new deal with FedEx and move the business over to FedEx? And I said, my recommendation would be no, but you know, what do you want to do? And they said, no, we don't, we don't want to make the move. So, you know, I talked to a lot of customers, only one came to me. I only know of this one that was approached. All the customers were approached. I got approached because I have an account number, which was, was sort of funny. Um, but um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that it was very successful. Did some people decide to make the move? Yeah. What surprises me is it would be easier for a small to medium-sized company to make the move than a very large one. That would be tricky when you have, you know, when you, if you're giving, and what I would consider a large account would be 40 million plus a year in, in revenue that you're, you're giving to the carrier. To make a move like that, the negotiation to make the move can be six to nine months. And so I'm suspicious of FedEx getting a very large customer. Maybe they're classifying a large customer as someone who has $5 million uh, 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 a year in business. Well, yeah, and everything's relative, but that's not a super huge customer. In my opinion, I doubt very much that it was a really big customer because if it was, guys like me would be hearing about it. You would see the information online and, and I'm not. It's possible it happened. I think it was probably uh, a customer under 10 million. And I don't think they got a lot of those customers. And, uh, and again, I also said, we are starting to see a very small migration of business from UPS to other carriers. Uh, Carol Tomei, the CEO of uh, UPS has acknowledged that, that it's starting to happen. But that's normal. It happens every cycle. What I think is a little bit different, and this is what's taken me by surprise uh, a little bit, is what FedEx announced in the last three months regarding their cost reduction initiatives. That 
indirectly is going to impact what UPS can pay their drivers in terms of increased compensation. Uh, the reason is, even though, look, it, FedEx has been doing horrible in general for the past year, they probably can turn it around. They're obviously reducing a lot of operating expense and cutting back. So we know that FedEx is, in the next two to three years, is going to remove $6 billion in annualized operating expense. That is an unbelievable number. And they're doing it, they're going to have eliminated four billion of that by next summer. That is an, an amazingly short period of time to make such major changes to your operation. Well, if you pay attention, and a lot of times it doesn't get a lot of attention, they are just shutting down chunks of their business. Uh, two weeks ago, they announced that they're going to shut down 30 LTL terminals. That's a big deal, because when you're taking LTL terminals out of the picture, then you're not as close to your customer and ultimately service suffers. So UP, FedEx is really aggressive on cost reduction. UPS has been reducing cost all along. FedEx would, would wait four or five years before they did things aggressively and then they'd have a buyout and they'd, 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 and five or 10,000 people would take a buyout and they'd get rid of people. It, uh, and that's, that's how they would address where they need to reduce headcount. It was really a stupid way to manage your business because, one, you didn't have to pay people necessarily $100,000 or over $100,000 to go away. Um, and you shouldn't wait till you do it all at once. You need to be managing your business on a daily basis and making those adjustments. That's what UPS does. And they've been doing that. That's why UPS is a better managed company than FedEx. Now, interestingly, this doesn't apply to FedEx ground ISPs because they're their own companies. And the way they manage is, 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 is their business. So I'm not including them in this statement when I say FedEx wasn't or isn't a very well-managed company. I think a lot of the ISPs do a wonderful job. So, so it, it doesn't apply to them. But I, I, I still think that just because FedEx is taking so much cost out of the enterprise, UPS has to be more aggressive in doing that. And when you take more, when, when you, when, when you have to make those types of reductions, you're also potentially putting some business at risk because you're getting farther away from the customer. So what's going to happen? And, and, and then also, if you're looking at less, potentially less volume or flat volume because you're doing less for your customers because you have fewer drivers out there, fewer trucks, fewer terminals, whatever it is, then, you know, you're not going to be making as much money. And then if, if they, if, 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 uh, if they paid, if they gave the Teamsters what they wanted, a lot of, a lot of money or benefits or whatever it is, they may not have a way to pay for it because they're reducing their footprint aggressively, not as aggressively as FedEx, but they have to keep up with FedEx. And so what that means, they can't pay those drivers in, in terms of additional compensation. They can't do now what they could do in the last 20 or 30 years because the money's just not going to be there because of what FedEx is doing. Does that sort of make sense? That does make sense. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things I wanted to come back to. We're talking about the chances of whether or not UPS ultimately does go on strike. And you had mentioned you think it's unlikely. However, the big announcements from FedEx over the past few months, FedEx won, uh, you know, kind of doing away, and, and we'll see exactly how it plays out. But massive cost reductions on the part of FedEx, UPS's direct competitor, how and, and how that increases the chance that there will be a UPS strike because uh, UPS doesn't have the ammo necessarily to appease the Teamsters and give them what they want because they're under a tremendous amount of pressure from their big competitor, FedEx, with this big cost reduction and everything else. So so let's talk about the chances of it happening. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's different things pulling against each other. You know, there's the FedEx announcement, which we had just covered, and how that may increase the chances that a strike does happen. 
Dean, why are you confident or, or, or what's your level of confidence that a strike won't happen and why? Because the UPS rank and file members, especially the drivers, do very, very well. I mean, anywhere, and, and there are there are different pay scales depending on which local region you fall under, but compensation probably ranges anywhere from $37 to $45 an hour, uh, a lot of overtime. That's a problem. Actually, one of the points that they'll be negotiating, the Teamsters will want, is they'll want less mandatory overtime because UPS drivers work really, really hard. And, and while they're all probably, you know, the vast majority of legacy drivers are six figures with great compensation. But if they're just killing you by the amount of work they're asking you to do by giving you a lot of overtime so they don't have to hire, then that's that's a, a problem. So I, I, I don't think that the drivers are hungry for a boatload of more money or benefits. I think if they can, you know, keep something that equates close to cost of living increases in a, in the contract, they'll be fine with, with that. Uh, they want work rules changes more than every, anything. They want grievance uh, processes addressed. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, addressed. Um, they want the process for bidding addressed, but they're not asking for a lot of additional money, in my opinion. And that's one reason why I, I, I think that they're not going to go on strike. More than anything, uh, you know, five or six years ago, not enough when, when the collective bargaining agreement was negotiated between the Teamsters negotiation body and UPS and it went out to vote, not enough drivers turned out to vote to warrant recognizing the vote. And the contract was implemented based on the fact that UPS, the new UPS and the Teamsters agreed at the management level. And because not enough drivers turned out to vote in favor of it, it just automatically was implemented. And what that tells me is that there's a lot of apathy out there amongst the rank and file uh, drivers and handlers at UPS. And I just don't think they have a lot of confidence in general in their union. So what do we see? We see the union trying to make themselves more relevant. And I think they're maybe trying to create some issues and problems that aren't a huge concern for the rank and file, but you know, they're somewhat, everybody always wants to make more money, right? But it's more than, and then salary, it's other issues. And so I just don't think that the drivers have it in them to want to go on strike because of what they make. They're looking pretty good right now with regards to their pay and, and, and benefits. And maybe the union is trying to make them think that, no, we need to do much better. We need to do much better. Well, you always want to do much better, but they also don't want to put at risk what they have. And what they have is the highest paid or, or all, well, there are some LTL drivers that probably make more. Okay. But in terms of the parcel end of it, by far the highest compensated drivers in the industry, and they don't want to disturb this. And the union's trying to make themselves look relevant and say, we need to do this, this, and this. So I think what ultimately will happen is I think the impact will be neutral on UPS. And I think UPS, UPS can negotiate that with the Teamsters. It'll be a give and tank. The Teamsters are saying, no, we're not going to give anything back. They're absolutely going to give things back at the end of the day. And UPS needs to have the impact be neutral. They need to be able to come out and say that publicly. Because remember, it's a publicly traded company. And then all the investment analysts can go ahead and say, okay, we're not going to see a deterioration in UPS's margin because the negotiation is over and the impact's neutral. And I'm good with neutral. So I think that's what UPS is shooting for, is a neutral impact. I'll give you something here, but I've got to take away something here. Also, the union wants to, there's a second class of driver um, 
that makes less part-time driver. And they, they want to elevate their pay. They want to make them equal with the other full-time drivers in terms of pay and benefits. That may happen, but if it does happen, the Teamsters are absolutely going to have to give something back somewhere else with regards to work rules and, and things like that. And then another subject that nobody's talking about, but I think is a big deal, is, is UPS owns Roadie. And Roadie is an on-demand pickup and delivery company. And, you know, it's crowdsourced and, and they have operations in major markets across the U.S. Um, I, while no one's come out and said it, I will guarantee you that the union is trying to put restrictions on what Roadie can do. And UPS will not let that happen. I do not think UPS will let these, these uh, negotiations impact their flexibility that they have with an on-demand crowdsourced pickup and delivery capability. And that's a big deal because if you look, one of the when, when I consult with people, they say, well, what's the biggest trend in the parcel industry? Well, one of the biggest trends is forward stocking inventory, micro fulfillment, you know, putting inventory in smaller facilities closer to the densest populations so you can deliver same day and next day. That trend is real. It's, it's, not, it, it's not going away. And that's something that an on-demand delivery capability can support because it's a local last mile delivery. So for 10 years now, all we've been hearing about is last mile this, last mile that, it's a great solution, blah, 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 blah. Well, I think, you know, I live in that world. I want to say, does it make sense? Yeah, but now it's really making sense as we move forward and with forward stocking micro fulfillment solutions, which require just a local last mile delivery. They and 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 so what that means is that there'll be fewer integrated carrier moves because you won't have as many companies that are distributing from one, two, or three national fulfillment centers. And they'll have they'll have put a lot of inventory closer to the customer. So that means you're going to have fewer zone six, seven, and eight shipments with UPS and FedEx. And that's not good for UPS. It's not good for the UPS drivers, but UPS can have Rody pick up the slack and that gain. And Rody can conceivably benefit from that. That's why I think if, if UPS is going to dig their heels in on anything, it's going to be keeping the Rody capability, fully a fully owned company by UPS, totally separate from anything that has to do with legacy UPS. That's interesting. So forward stocking distribution, and just for our listeners who maybe aren't super familiar with that, Dean, could you tell us a little bit more about what that model is? And we don't have to hang on to this for too long. Sure. Um, so a lot of it, we think of it as just being in, in place with uh, traditional e-commerce merchants, but it also works for business. And what it means is, and, and what, what gets us to forward stocking facilities is technology and um, forecasting and analytics, some artificial intelligent, um, intelligence. I'm not an expert on AI, so I'm not going to tell you how. But the, the bottom line is the technology today allows Amazon to decide in the zip code where I live what the people, you know, what their demographic is, how much money are they making, what, what's, what are their purchasing behaviors, and what are they most likely to want to buy. And so instead of this gray sports polo, well, I've got a gray one. Well, I don't think gray is a real popular color. So, but if the two most popular colors are red and green, What's going to happen in a forward stocking fulfillment center, which may only be 30,000 square feet instead of a million square feet for a regional fulfillment center or national, what, what's going to happen is they're just going to stock the red and green one and they'll stock it in fewer sizes because they know how big or small people are today, right? I mean, all this is factored in. So they don't have to put as much forward stocking inventory close to the customer as you might think to satisfy customers' particular demands because they know what the customer wants. That's number one. Number two, 
But we're also looking at an environment, you've seen this in the airline industry in the last 10 years, where you give the customer less to be profitable. And so that means, yeah, if you want your shipment in one or two days and you want free shipping, then you can't have every size of every color palette for this polo shirt. You have to pick from these. And my experience is that's what customers are going to do. They're, they're going to pick from that. So I, I think that's the whole concept behind, behind micro-fulfillment forward stocking, smaller centers, less inventory, but inventory that you feel very comfortable that the customer is going to buy. And, and what will happen is that customer may be able to get the gray one, but maybe the gray one comes from a single national fulfillment center or dropship location. And if that's the case, then maybe they pay more too, because the cost of handling that, because you're going to have to move it across the country, is greater than delivering it locally. I know I've been a little long-winded there, but do you think that made sense, what I said? That does make sense. And it makes sense that, you know, this is this is something that is trending up. It has potential to kind of disrupt the current state of last mile deliveries. UPS is apparently aware of that because they went out and acquired this other company, Rody. If your industry is going to be disrupted, it may as well be disrupted by a company that you own, so you can at least benefit from that. It, does FedEx have any involvement with this kind of budding model? No, FedEx, it, FedEx offered a very limited amount of local delivery tied to their FedEx office, old Kinko's Copies locations. And, and those weren't those were business shipments uh, and, and local messenger services have been around forever. They're also very, very ex- expensive. However, there's something unique going on here with regards to FedEx. And I know we're talking about UPS, but FedEx's ground model is more open to supporting local on-demand pickup and delivery. They can't do that today, but because they're individually owned territories by an independent service provider, it's going to be easier for those companies to potentially bring on additional drivers to support on-demand delivery. So this may not be a bad thing for FedEx, given the fact that they have this more flexible and lower cost ground contractor model, they could benefit from this. And I'd like to throw something else out there. I wouldn't be surprised to see as FedEx moves forward to allow those drivers to also provide pickup services for other local on-demand pickup and delivery services for local merchants. Walmart is doing it right now with, 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 with their initiative. And that makes a lot of sense because, again, it's only a local distribution model. You don't have pickup. You don't have the first mile or the middle mile, which really complicates things. It's only the last mile. I would not be surprised in five years to see FedEx morph their ground pickup and delivery. And it's the ground name is going away. It's just going to be FedEx pickup and delivery. I would not be surprised to see them figure out a way to allow those pickup and delivery companies to work with other companies now and put more packages in those trucks, improve scale, drive uh, improved uh, margin. And then if they're driving improved overall margin, that means maybe they can charge FedEx less to provide pickup and delivery services. That, that you know, that, that, that that's me being a consultant and sort of connecting the dots and looking forward, but it makes too much sense for FedEx to do that. UPS could not do that with their hourly model. It's just way, it, way too, it's, it's, it's too high cost, uh, but UPS can do it with Rody. Yeah, and I'm thinking about the alternative vehicle program that FedEx contractors have been using over the past few years. And this was something that FedEx only introduced I think it was during the COVID pandemic, but you know, traditionally when you think of FedEx ground delivering a package, you think of a step van that's white uh, with a driver wearing the uniform, 
purple and black uniform with the big logo on the side of the truck. Uh, but they are actually allowing these contractors now to deliver packages through what they call the AVP, which is Alternative Vehicle Program, where they can bring on a driver. It has a much lower barrier to entry. I mean, the amount of due diligence that they have to do in training with this particular driver, the bar is much lower. And they can actually deliver packages out of their own vehicle. So it's almost like uh, like the Uber of package delivery. You know, you can have someone show up with their Toyota Camry. I don't know how many packages you can fit in a Toyota Camry. Um, you know, and, and some contractors have gone out and actually purchased things like, you know, minivans and to have their own fleet of AVP vehicles. But this is something that's continuing to grow. It's very cost effective. Some of the largest service providers in the FedEx Ground Network have really latched onto this concept and they're growing it, making it a, a, a very important piece of their business. And it seems like it would play right into this forward stocking distribution it, model it, that you're talking it, about. It makes a lot of sense. And Walmart is doing it and they just announced their quarterly earnings. Uh, so um, last, uh, last week, which were really good. And the CEO did reference the fact that their new local pickup and delivery initiative for not just their stores, but other third parties in, in, in the market, it's, it's helping them a lot. So this is, this is a good thing, I think, for, for FedEx Ground. It's not a bad thing for, um, uh, for UPS because they have the roadie component. Now, the advantage for UPS is you're going to be able to provide better service when you've broken it off and you have a separate entity managing a very different type of delivery. So the challenge for FedEx Ground is going to be, how do we do that, add this component and not compromise service for the bread and butter portion of the business? And, and it's, it's doable. The other thing we haven't talked about is technology. Technology makes this all possible, right? Ten years ago, you never would have been able to, to do it. And now you can have a simple uh, route management platform that is going to integrate and manage shipments for multiple companies across multiple carriers. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's very doable. And it makes sense, ultimately, from a road congestion standpoint, if it means we have the vehicles that are out there making pickup delivery have more packages on them than they do today because they're not just servicing one company they're servicing multiple companies. It all makes a lot of sense. Dean, the last thing, last question that I have, and let's bring it back to the possibility of the UPS strike. Many of the listeners of this podcast are FedEx ground service providers, FedEx ground contractors. Uh, first part of the question, you would mentioned that you don't think a strike is going to happen. Could you put a percentage figure on that, just your level of confidence, and we won't hold you to it. Uh, and But really the main thing is, for the FedEx ground contractors listening to this podcast, is there anything that they should be thinking about? Is there anything that they should be doing to prepare for the possibility of a UPS strike? You know, <laughs> you're not going to believe I'm going to say this, but no. And my message to them would be protect the legacy customer. That should be your sole focus don't go out there and try and pick up 10 or 20% more business because really they can't pick up much more than 20% without wrecking everything, right? Uh, protect your legacy business and resist, if at all possible, going to help with deliveries. Now, this message is, is really more towards FedEx, corporate, and, and not the driver, not, not the ISPs. Uh, you really have to protect what you have in place and not be focused on trying to make a few extra bucks by taking uh, additional packages that you may not be able to deliver well. Look what happened during COVID. It was horrible. Purchase transportation for FedEx ground went up dramatically because they couldn't handle it. And it, and it hurt FedEx ground profitability and it hurt the local ISP. So I, I think what, we're, what I'm saying is I guess you have to look at this two ways. One from the ISP perspective and just focus on doing a good job for the customers that FedEx currently has and don't let all the background noise interfere with doing a good job for your existing customers. And then if, if FedEx can pick up 
some additional package. An example would be, you know, the driver, I, I will tell you what's a huge problem is if they go on strike, you're going to have contractors walking into these shipping locations and the, and, and, and the, the, the shipping manager is going to say, what's it going to take for you to take an extra hundred a day? Now, everybody wants to be a hero in this kind of situation and help someone else. They have to be rigid because they will be given strict guidelines based on shipping history on how many packages that they can pick up from a location in the event of a strike. They're not you FedEx ground is not likely they may say they'll take 10% more, but it'll be a it'll be a, a small number. So the, the the drivers and the ISPs have to work with FedEx corporate and have a strategy for controlling that so they don't get all these additional packages into the network that once they get to the local terminal, don't get sorted because the truck came in with 300, too many, 300 packages too many, and then the whole network breaks down. So be stern on whatever plan FedEx corporate puts in place to protect the existing customer base. That would be my message. And then part two of my message would be, if there is a strike, I don't think it'll last longer than a week. And, you know, if a strike, if you have a strike for a week, it's going to take a month to recover for both FedEx and, and UPS, more so UPS. Uh, but it's not, it wouldn't be, it won't be the end of the world. A one week strike will not be the end of the world. Something that goes up to two weeks or longer, then it's, then it's a potential catastrophe. You want to put a percentage figure on what you think the 80, chances are? Uh, I, I think an 80% chance that they don't strike. 80% chance that they don't strike. Right. Dean, anything else on this subject? You know, uh, no. Um, I, maybe one other thing. The CEO of UPS, Carol Tomei, is, in my opinion, one of the best CEOs in America, not just in transportation. And... She has tremendous people skills. And when you sit down and talk to her, it's real. Even though she's at this incredibly high level in, in corporate America, I think she's going to make the difference. At the end of the day, when it gets real, real testy, I think she's going to be the negotiation factor that lets this play out for both parties in the best way possible. It's a good place to wrap up. Dean, I appreciate you coming back onto the podcast. It's been fun talking with you. Thanks a lot. Routing for Success is brought to you by AP Equipment Financing. In today's competitive market, it is essential to acquire the right trucks at a fair price and finance them in a way that makes sense for your business. Leveraging their extensive network of truck and van suppliers, the experts at AP Equipment Financing will help you locate the best deals on step vans, cutaways, panel vans, and more. Deliver them straight to your facility and finance them with low monthly installment options. Click the link in the description or visit APFinancing.com for more information. Routing for Success is an independent production of AP Equipment Financing and is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by FedEx Corporation, FedEx Ground, Amazon, or any other logistics company discussed herein. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Routing for Success.